How wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing one of these mysteries of the universe that just refuses to be solved. One of the most persistent and one of the most frustrating mysteries in all of modern science, dark matter. The invisible substance or the invisible phenomenon that seems to be holding a lot of galaxies and galactic clusters together and seems to produce a lot of gravitational effects, such as powerful gravitational landing effects. But the phenomenon whose origin is a little bit unclear. We know it's out there, we see a lot of different effects, but after decades and decades of search and different experiments, and after trying different methods to try to find it, so far the actual particle producing these effects remains more or less elusive. Now there have been some hints here and there, but nothing concrete yet, and nothing definitive enough that could finally settle this mystery. But what if the answer to the search for dark matter wasn't actually hiding in some kind of a lab? but instead could be found in our kitchens. Because believe it or not, today we're going to be discussing a really intriguing study, the study that you see right here, where a group of international researchers proposed a new fascinating approach to solving this mystery. Here we can actually use something very common, sugar, and specifically sugar crystals, with the project now referred to as SWEET. And though this might sound kind of unusual and possibly even silly, here, this actually proposes something really interesting that can be used in a lot of other fields, because in essence, scientists here propose creating an extremely sensitive detector that can actually be used for a lot of different sciences, and possibly even lead to some really intriguing discoveries that have nothing to do with dark matter at all. And so in this video, let's discuss this a little bit more, talk about dark matter research and dark matter search in general, and also briefly discuss some of the other previous unusual propositions, such as, for example, using DNA. But first, let's review some of the basics in case you're not really familiar or forgot what dark matter is. And so, first of all, how do we know it even exists? Well, in the standard model of cosmology, only a very small fraction of matter seems to be made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so approximately 85% of all of the mass in the universe seems to be made out of something we just cannot see. We know it's there because it produces a lot of gravitational landing effects, and they cannot really be explained in any other way, but exactly what produces these effects is of course unknown. Now in the last few decades there's been a lot of potential explanations. Anything from a bunch of really tiny black holes, that are just very difficult to see and possibly are everywhere, this is what we refer to as the primordial black hole hypothesis, to basically some really bizarre particles that don't seem to interact with anything except for producing gravitational fields, with alternative explanations trying to explain everything by changing some of the formula, or by even suggesting that maybe this is some kind of an alternative universe basically producing the effects on our universe through some really bizarre means. So in other words, there are a lot of explanations, but really very little evidence for any of them. And that's because we can't really see this dark matter because it just doesn't interact with light or other electromagnetic radiation, we only really observe the effects through gravity. But the gravitational influence is very overwhelming. As we've discussed in many previous videos, for example when we look at various gravitational lenses or Einstein rings, they can only be explained if like 85 to 90 percent of everything in that lens is produced by something invisible and not by the stuff inside the galaxy. And so there's a big discrepancy between what we see around the universe and what we can then detect by looking at different particles. But I guess the biggest proof comes from the idea behind galactic rotations. And this is based on the observations of stars spinning around pretty much all of the galaxies. Here, if we actually expect things to work through Newtonian physics, stars would be spinning slower on the outskirts of the galaxy compared to the center. This is basically what happens to planets in the solar system. But in reality, pretty much all of the galaxies seem to have something a little bit more flat, with all of the stars spinning at the same speed. And though there have been explanations that try to basically modify Newtonian gravity formula to try to recreate these curves, right now the most widely accepted explanation is still the mysterious dark matter. Basically these invisible particles holding the galaxy together and preventing stars from flying apart. You can check out some of the previous videos on other propositions and why they don't seem to work as well in one of the videos in the description. And so here dark matter is not just some kind of a cosmic oddity, it seems to be a crucial explanation for everything we observe around us when it comes to galactic scales. And that's independent of whether this is just a particle or some kind of a bizarre phenomenon, because here we just see the effects, and the effects are definitely there. And here's actually a really cool map showing us the chunks of dark matter, or specifically the landing effects produced by the dark matter, 
produced by an international collaboration approximately a decade ago. Moreover, dark matter also explains why galaxies were even formed to begin with, because it essentially provided a kind of a scaffolding for a lot of stars to gather around and to start forming galaxies. So in other words, it does explain a lot of things, but we just have no idea what it is. And this is why, for many decades, there was an attempt to find this mysterious particle. And for many decades, the leading candidate was referred to as WIMP, weakly interacting massive particle. Here it was hypothesized to be maybe somewhat similar in mass or in energy to a typical proton, or maybe just a little bit heavier. With the search for this particle usually involving some kind of an enormous apparatus, very often using incredibly sensitive detectors made out of heavy crystals of germanium or silicon, and often operated underground in order to shield them from cosmic ray radiation. And the idea here was really simple. If one of these wimps passes through Earth, and if it hits an atom in the crystal, it should technically transfer a tiny amount of energy, which should then be visible to one of these detectors. And so because the detector is so cold and so sensitive, it should register some kind of a collision, possibly measurable as heat or even some kind of a visual photonic signal. So basically a flash of light. But the thing is, after decades and many different experiments, including several attempts to do them again, these highly sensitive searches so far have come up empty. And while some experiments did actually maybe discover something, in most cases it was possibly something else entirely and very likely not dark matter. Once again, some of the videos in the description explore this more. And so this lack of conclusive evidence so far severely constrained the traditional WIMP hypothesis. Or basically maybe dark matter was not a particle that we thought it was, and was instead either super light or essentially barely containing any mass or any energy, or the opposite, maybe it was just super heavy. And so for the past few years, a lot of scientists had to abandon this WIMP model and look elsewhere. With most scientists now focusing on the light dark matter model, suggesting that dark matter is so light that it possibly even just behaves as a wave instead of a typical particle. And so far there's been quite a lot of intriguing evidence in the last few years possibly supporting this hypothesis. But until there is enough evidence, we're not really going to discuss this yet. And that's actually why we have this new experiment that is somewhat exciting. And that's because to detect some of this light dark matter, we do need a new detector that's even more sensitive, because if a dark matter particle is very light, it's just not going to be visible to much heavier nuclei like, for example, germanium or silicon. In some sense, it's kind of like, I guess, trying to move an enormous bowling ball by just throwing a bunch of ping pongs at it. It's just not going to move much. There's very little energy transfer. And so to try to detect something that's even lighter, we have to use the lightest possible particles. And in this case, this would be hydrogen. And so this is where this sweet project comes in. Because in this case, scientists realize that organic materials, especially those containing a lot of hydrogen, may actually be perfect candidates in helping us detect very tiny particles. And so in this case, organic material they chose is, of course, sucrose or C12H22O11. And sucrose molecule contains 22 hydrogen atoms. It offers a much higher density of light nuclei compared to just using pure hydrogen. But much more importantly, unlike previous attempts, this would be super, super cheap. Mostly because this is sugar and you can literally find it everywhere. And so the overall goal of this sweet project is to try to evaluate the suitability of using sugars, and specifically sugar crystals, as a potential dark matter detector, or even a detector for a lot of other particles. And so here's roughly what this experiment looked like. In this case, to conduct this experiment, first they had to grow the target. And in this case, they grew these monocrystalline sugar samples by slowly recrystallizing commercially available sugar from a supersaturated solution for several weeks. Or, I guess to rephrase this, they took a super, super sweet water, let it stand in the dark for a few weeks, which would then result in newly grown crystals. Which, by the way, is a super fun experiment if you have young kids. I did this with my son a few weeks back and he absolutely loved it. And so then, by growing these crystals, they chose one as the main sample. Here it was just under one gram. With the next step being refrigeration. This was done at the Max Planck Institute for Physics in Germany, where the sample was cooled to an extremely cold temperature of just 7 millikelvin, almost absolute zero. With the crystal then assessed in two different ways. First, with a heat sensor, in order to detect tiny thermal pulses possibly produced by particle interactions, and by using a very highly sensitive light detector, which would possibly detect some kind of a light flash or some kind of a light scintillation that may be produced if a particle strikes the crystal. And in this case, trying to detect both heat and light simultaneously is crucial for a lot of these cryogenic detectors. 
This is because anything else might be produced by some kind of a noise or accidental interaction, but if you detect both heat and light, this is usually the result of a particle collision. And then they essentially waited for approximately 19 hours collecting data. With the initial findings confirming that sugar does seem to work, because here they successfully detected thermal pulses resulting from particle interactions, showing the material response in consistent and measurable manner. Or basically that the material was able to detect certain particles. And more importantly, scientists observed a very significant number of events where the heat pulse and the light emission seem to coincide. So here they definitely detected something. But here we cannot claim this is dark matter yet. Because while they observed consistent signals with larger particles, since this was not underground or hidden away from radiation, this could have been from some kind of a cosmic ray or something else entirely producing very similar effects. But I guess more importantly, at this point, they were not even trying to find these light dark matter particles, because here this was just to test if this concept even works, and if we can indeed use sugar to try to detect something out there. And so the conclusion from this theoretical analysis is that this approach is very promising. Sucrose seems to be sensitive enough to detect a lot of stuff, and may even be more sensitive compared to a lot of other more expensive things, such as diamonds, sapphires, or helium. And so for all we know, maybe some of the future experiments may indeed use sugar to try to find dark matter and a lot of other stuff. And that's because even though this is primarily designed for dark matter detection, due to the nature of the detector, it is capable of finding so many other particles and particle interactions. For example, it can definitely be used for gamma ray and X-ray detection, and even produce extremely sensitive detectors that would be much cheaper than anything we use today. Likewise, it can also be used to detect cosmic rays or even all kinds of radioactivity, and especially radioactivity coming from carbon-14, one of the isotopes of carbon that's often produced in the upper atmosphere. And so here, by using this monocrystalline sucrose sample, in theory, it could be used for detecting a lot of different particles and a lot of different types of radiation, but in this case, by using something that's easily available and super cheap. And especially because sugar in this case seems to be quite sensitive to low mass particles. Something that's usually a lot more difficult to detect by using things like germanium or silicon. But to improve the chances of detection, for the next part of the experiment, the team behind the study plans to grow larger crystals and even use higher purity sugar in order to see if they can maybe detect some kind of a particle that might be dark matter after all. Although here I wanted to mention something else before we finish the video. This is not even the strangest proposition. One of the strangest propositions when it comes to dark matter search was using DNA. We discussed the story a few months back, but here by using DNA strands suspended in the way you see in the picture, and having a bunch of them hang from some kind of a gold sheet, it might also be possible to detect dark matter or a lot of other particles as well. And that's because in this case, every time some kind of a particle passes through this strand, it might actually rip it apart, with the DNA strand then falling to the bottom and producing a kind of a detectable signal. But because there are so many of them and they are in three dimensions, it then even becomes possible to track the trajectory, because when a dark matter particle passes through this, it cuts DNA strands in such a way that broken pieces are collected and analyzed, allowing us to reconstruct the particle's track. But ever since this was announced, unfortunately no one has tried this yet, so we don't really know if this particular method works or not. Either way, this was pretty cool, and could one day also be used to detect something that's not just dark matter, because this would be an extremely sensitive detection device. You can learn more about this in the study you see right here. And honestly, for me, this is why dark matter search is so exciting. It forces scientists to come up with these super unusual but also super intriguing experimental devices and experimental techniques that we would never have thought about if it wasn't for this bizarre search. And so even if dark matter is something entirely different, and even if we never find it, just because of all of the devices that were created in the last few years, the actual search itself has already led to a lot of technological advances and a lot of super cool devices. And chances are that in the next few decades, some of these creations might find their way into other industries. But once we discover something else about this mysterious dark matter, we'll come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access. You can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.